So let's talk about absolute dating. Absolute dating involves determining the actual age of a rock or fossil using radioactive decay. In our previous videos and in class, we discussed how there's two types of methods to determining the age of rocks on Earth. There's radioactive decay, which this video will be dealing with, and geologic sequencing, which we dealt with earlier. Absolute dating uses the process of radioactive decay to understand how old a fossil or rock is. It's giving a sample an actual number to represent its time on Earth. So let's talk about the process of radioactive decay. To begin, we'll do a quick chemistry review. This is an atom. And an atom basically has three components, three subatomic particles. There are neutrons, there are protons, and then there are electrons. Neutrons have no charge, protons have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge. Together, the neutrons and the protons make up the nucleus of the atom while the electrons are circulating or orbiting around the nucleus. Because the neutrons have no charge and the protons have a positive charge, the nucleus has a overall positive charge which attracts the electrons to it and holds them in place. On the periodic table of elements, each element contains one atom with different numbers of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So here's the element hydrogen. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one. That means its nucleus has one proton. And hydrogen has an atomic mass equal to its protons and neutrons of 1.008. Now I know that hydrogen doesn't have any neutrons. So that's why its atomic mass is really one. See, protons and neutrons are about the same size and about the same mass, which is equal to about one atomic mass unit. So if hydrogen had a neutron in its nucleus, its atomic mass would be two, but that's not the case. And it doesn't really matter for what we're about to talk about. If I move down to the element lithium, now lithium has an atomic number equal to three, which means it has three protons. If I add one more proton to lithium, I get beryllium. Beryllium has four protons. So what makes each element a little bit different is how many protons it has in its nucleus. If I were to look at the two elements, lithium and beryllium, with different atomic numbers, here's the difference. Their nucleus size is just a little different because of the extra proton in beryllium. There's another part to this not shown on the periodic table. Every element can have an isotope or multiple isotopes. Isotopes have the same atomic number, which is the number of protons, but a different atomic mass, which is the number of neutrons. So in the case of beryllium with an atomic mass of nine, if there was a radioactive, if there was an isotope of beryllium, it would have an atomic mass of 10. It has one more neutron than it normally should. So an isotope is really just an extra neutron in the nucleus. But some isotopes are unstable or radioactive. And because of that, they break down and release particles over time. This is known as radioactive decay. And radioactive decay is a predictable and irreversible process. On the first page of our Earth Science Reference Tables, we have four radioactive isotopes listed and their decay products, what they are converted into over time. The the process of radioactive decay involves the breakdown of a radioactive isotope into what's called a decay product. The longer the amount of time a radioactive isotope has to decay, the greater the amount of decay product that will be present. The amount of time it takes for half of the atoms in a sample of a radioactive isotope to change into their decay product is called the half-life. And on our reference table, here are the half-lives associated with the four radioactive isotopes we're given. Those radioactive isotopes have half-lives written in scientific notation, and if we actually drew them out, they would look like this. To apply radioactive dating, the sample you wish to date must have one of the radioactive isotopes that can be predictably broken down. For example, this saber-toothed tiger skeleton contains the radioactive isotope carbon-14. Now carbon-14 
breaks down into nitrogen-14. If we were to measure how much carbon-14 was left and how much nitrogen-14 exists, we can then calculate the age of the fossil. Here's how that would look. We're starting with 50 grams of carbon-14. So when the saber-toothed tiger was alive, it absorbed those 50 grams somehow. And when it died and became fossilized, that carbon-14, because it's radioactive, began to break down. After one half-life, half of the carbon-14 has broken down into nitrogen-14. So I have equal amounts, 25 grams of carbon-14 and 25 grams of nitrogen-14. I started with 50 grams of carbon-14 and zero grams of nitrogen-14. So after one half-life, I have half the amount of the carbon-14 I started with. It takes 5,700 years for one half-life of carbon-14 to take place. I didn't make that number up, it came from our reference table. After two half-lives, I have 12 and a half grams of carbon-14, half the amount that I had previously, and 37.5 grams of nitrogen-14. This now takes 11,400 years to accomplish, or two half-lives. After another 5,700 years, or a total of 17,100 years, the amount of carbon-14 is halved again, and the amount of nitrogen-14 continues to grow. If I add up both values here, I still get the original amount, which was 50 grams. The process converts matter and doesn't destroy it. And after four half-lives, or a total of 22,800 years, the amount of carbon-14, which started at 50, has been reduced to 3.125 grams. This process will continue until all of the carbon-14 has been converted into nitrogen-14. Some more about carbon-14. Carbon-14 is generally used to date organic material or rocks that are about 50,000 years old or younger. Most rocks are too old to use carbon-14, but fossils and the remains of living things are most effectively dated using carbon-14 because the half-life is so short. Potassium-40 decays into two products, which is argon-40 and cadmium-40. We use potassium-40 in dating very old rocks and fossils. This can apply to almost all rocks because the half-life is 1,300,000,000 years. Uranium-238 decays into lead-206, and we use it to date the age of the Earth. That's because the half-life is equivalent to 4.6 billion years. And finally, rubidium-87. Rubidium-87 decays into strontium-87 and has no uses on Earth because its half-life is just too long. What we actually use rubidium-87 for is dating meteorites. One half-life for rubidium-87 is equivalent to 49 billion years. So that's it for now regarding absolute dating. Thanks for watching.